a lot of times, you know, people will come and they say, Hey, I just want to save energy. And then you dig into it and they're like, well, I actually want to, you know, charge higher rents by improving the look of the space and offering this, this, and this. I'm like, great. Well, we can do both. You know, this episode brought to you by suites at Madison meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year suites at Madison where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida investment real estate talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is your co-host, Eric Odom, along with Stephen Silverman. Stephen, entering into the, not entering, we're solidly in the fourth quarter of 2022. Looking forward to a new year. Going downhill all the way. (laughs) We were talking about how long we've been doing this, and I said I was a young guy. I remember that. It's a long time ago. It is a long time ago. How many years is it now? And then you tried to pass on to telling me that you're... Younger today than when you were then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like Methuselah. <laughs> so anyway, we just went through a little event, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the we got we we dodged another storm. Fortunately, the storm season was pretty light, but I'm sure the folks in Northport to Naples don't agree with with us. It was a nasty one, and um, you know, Tampa's been very very fortunate. And that that it's not been uh, hit, um, but uh, certainly heart goes out to our brothers and sisters south of us. Uh, it's it was not a, a pretty situation, but hopefully we're done with them for the year. I noticed the Gulf is already we've had some cold fronts moving through, and the Gulf has already cooled a few degrees, and it was just a was really a cauldron waiting to incubate these uh, these storms at this time of the year. That's just uh, we get those the Gulf storms. We see we tend to begin late in the season. So anyway, glad it's over. Anyway, all these wonderful effects of nature, but got us thinking about the environment and and also how to address energy, which just keeps going up and up. Yeah, and you know we we wanted to talk about that, and the other thing we wanted to talk about, we got a review and a comment from one of our listeners in Lakeland. Chris says, "What's going on with uh, interest rates? Every time I turn around, you're seeing an uptick." I know there's an inflationary problem in this country, but can you get someone to come on the show and talk about their forecast for the mortgage market? And Chris, really appreciate you taking the time to send us a note, leave us a review. That's uh, very important for us to be able to get guests. They look at our reviews and they see who's listening, who's paying attention, and it's important for them on making a decision on whether they're going to invest time in our show. But Chris, funny you mentioned that. Steve and I were just talking about it this week. We are trying to get another guest to the show that's going to talk about the interest rate market and what do they see of happening here. We're still in an inverted yield curve. That's been an interesting situation, scenario here, where uh, short-term interest rates are higher than long-term, which typically that goes, that correlates with a recession. Uh, not always, uh, it's not perfectly correlated, but certainly that's that's what the forecasters are saying now, and it's a matter of, of, of time. And But it'd be good to have somebody come on, and we're looking for somebody right now who could talk to us about interest rate and give us some idea about what their forecast is for the next uh, 12 months. Stephen, we've, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about energy today. It's a, a topic a lot of our listeners don't think too much about. Many times, energy costs are, and the carry costs of a building, the expenses are just passed on to the tenants, so they don't necessarily think about it. But we're going to cover some points today that might let them think a little bit more seriously about addressing it or at least uh, analyzing whether it makes uh, sense to make any improvements in their property. Stephen, any housekeeping items before we get our guest on? No, let's move on to the show. Today, we have with us... Chris Kaiser. Chris is a partner in Sona Energy. Sona Energy is a provider of turnkey clean energy projects to multi-site commercial spaces for property owners and tenants. Chris has an engineering degree from Georgia Tech, and we look forward to talk to him today about how to save money with clean energy. Chris, welcome to the Invest Florida Show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. 
Uh, Chris, really appreciate you investing some time with us today. Uh, you and I have been friends for a while, and we've talked about, as you've sort of moved along in your career, we've talked about ICSC, which is the International Council of Shopping Centers. It's the uh, retail real estate show, the, the big one. There's a big one that happens in Florida. There's one in Atlanta, all over the place. But we had talked about that and shared some ideas as you were progressing in your career uh, into really green energy, a lot of LED. Why don't you give us a 30,000-foot view of what that is, and then I want to talk about how you got to where you are today. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, and uh, again, thanks for having me on. So I kind of encapsulate what we do uh, as clean energy. So that is uh, really three things. So the first is energy efficiency. So it's always best to start by reducing the energy you use, and that's by efficiency, and that's through things like LED lighting retrofits or HVAC efficiency upgrades. The second one is renewable energy. So for the purposes of commercial buildings, that's solar PV, uh, wind and wind power production typically doesn't make sense uh, outside of utility scale developments. So we've talked about efficiency, renewable energy production with solar PV, and the third one that has got a lot of attention over the past couple of years is EV charging equipment, which uh, kind of falls under transportation, but you're, you're fueling, you could be fueling them on site with EV chargers on the property. Uh, so between the efficiency, renewable energy, and EV charging, I lump those all into uh, the clean energy capsule. So talk to us about how you got here today in terms of where you currently are with Sona, uh, because you weren't always in green solutions, were you? Yeah, it's a great question. I knew uh, from my time at Georgia Tech, I took a class on the ethics of business sustainability. And in that class, you know, one of the case studies we went over was interface carpet. So I'm sure a lot of your clients and customers in the office spaces have probably interface carpet. And it was uh, started by Ray Anderson. And he wrote a book called Mid-Course Correction, and it was all about how he had this uh, epiphany on how they were running their business, and they were a carpet factory, right? And they, so they take in oil, and they have all these streams of uh, raw materials, and they have waste. And uh, he basically wanted to create a more sustainable company and how they could reduce waste and it'd be more sustainable for the environment. And that was back in 2004, and... It really opened my eyes to what I wanted to do for a career, and I wanted to help companies adopt more sustainable and energy-efficient clean energy strategies. Uh, I graduated. I was selling electrical automation equipment, and uh, I got a great overview of different factories, different businesses, because I was going into those places, selling the equipment that was operating them. It took a little bit longer for me to actually find a role in clean energy. I, I was actually moonlighting for a while in 2007, 2008 for a solar installer here in Atlanta. Uh, as part of that, we actually installed one of the largest solar thermal hot water systems for, it was actually for Cox Automotive. It was Mannheim Auto Dealership, and they were washing 300 cars a day. So they wanted a solar thermal system to preheat the water before it went into the boiler so they wouldn't have to use as much gas in the boiler. So uh, I worked on that system as a kind of part-time um, job. And then in 2010, I got hired by a company. Uh, at that time, it was Groom Energy. And uh, LEDs had really first come on the scene as a product that could be commercially viable to retrofit uh, fluorescent and high-intensity uh, gas discharge lighting. And uh, from then on, I've, I've been doing lighting retrofits and the past couple of years, EV charging installations. You know, it's, it's interesting because many times when we're talking to investors and you talk to them about energy savings and green energy solutions, and sort of their eyes roll behind their head and they don't necessarily you know, think they see the cost savings that have it make sense. Or they say that, well, we just pass this on to our tenants and we don't really care about it. But it's, it's interesting, and I had this exact conversation with one of the large building owners, it's probably seven or eight years ago, and they were, they were pretty adamant there was no value for them in, 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 in trying to have any type of, uh, of uh, green energy solutions. Uh, and it's now fast forward to today, and I, I just uh, did a, like a 7,000-square-foot lease for one of our 
uh, one of our clients, and they're offering discounts for the tenant if they take their LED solution on the tenant improvement. So, of course, I had to, it's the first time I actually noticed that. <laughs> and I had to go back and give him a little bit of the raspberry. And I was like, well, what happened? What happened there? And he's like, oh, well, you know what, what the reality situation is? The office market is really tight. And it's important for us because our common area maintenance expenses, which we, of course, pass on to the tenant, are higher or they were higher than, the, uh, than our competitors. And we were losing deals as a result. And so we started looking at what some of the other people were starting to do in, the, in, in, our, in our market and realizing that we had to become more efficient. And so this is what we've, what we've done. We've made these we've moves, and it's, it's been actually quite shocking. The energy savings has been better than even the most aggressive estimates that some of these consultants came in and talked to us about. So I don't know if you have any success stories on that too with commercial property owners, because as a, as a rule, I think commercial property owners are a pretty skeptical group. Yes. So, so, so Chris, on, on that subject, I mean, could you tell us what kinds of savings you've seen implementing some of these uh, clean energy solutions? Yeah. I mean, this is still sort of the success story that you know, we talk about. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, you know, first, I'll speak to kind of the economic benefits, Eric, and then I think the, the longer discussion is some of the, the qualitative benefits, right? So if the economic is the quantitative, we can spend more time talking about the qualitative, which is actually, as we'll see, is probably the more important reason to do a lot of these things. But first, on the quantitative, and, and I'll focus on LED lighting because it's really the lowest hanging fruit because your returns on investments are the fastest. So for you know a typical LED lighting project, what I tell customers is if you do not have LED, then you have a project opportunity. And projects typically range anywhere from one and a half to three year return on investment. So for instance, you know I've, I've done an apartment common area lighting. So this is you know breezeways, uh, lease center, exterior lighting. Uh, for a medium-sized apartment complex, maybe that's a hundred thousand dollar retrofit, and that's the cost of the audit, the design, the hardware, the installation. Um, and there may or may not be utility incentives for that, but let's just use a hundred thousand dollars. And so the annual energy savings for something like that might be thirty-five thousand dollars a year. And so that's how you get that, you know, three-year simple return on investment, uh, not taking into account any tax incentives which there are some for LED lighting upgrades. So with LED, it's, it's usually pretty cut and dry. Uh, you basically take the, the type of light that you have presently. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you guys are in an office setting right now, you look above your head, there's a good probability you have a two by four recess tropper above your head. And that probably has two or three, four foot fluorescent tubes if they haven't been retrofit to LED. So I'll do that a lot on simple conversations. It's like, hey, just give me an estimate on how many two by four fixtures you have. If you have three tubes, they're probably a, a T8 bulb on a normal ballast factor. And, you know, all this kind of math in terms of what the wattage is existing is, is accepted. And so then the only other variable is how long those lights are on each day. So if they're on 24 hours a day, then your ROI is amazing. If they're only on, you know, two hours a day, then your ROI is not going to be that great, right? Because there's just not that much energy consumed to begin with. But at the end of the day, for most office environments or retail environments, uh, we as, as Sona actually do the majority of our work in, in grocery and other retail where the lights are basically on 24-7. Uh, they may dim some of the lights down or, or turn off certain breakers uh, when they are closed. But for the most part, you have very long run hours, which means you have a lot of energy consumed by the lighting system. So you get much better return on investments when your lights are on a longer periods of time. But the good rule of thumb is, is that two and a half, three year return on investment is, is what you see for lighting. And then in warmer environments, uh, you know, the lights actually put out a decent amount of heat. So there's actually some uh, benefit uh, by reducing your heat load in the building that your HVAC system does not have to get rid of as much now. There's a lot of carry-on effects. Uh, everything adds into a, a great return on investment, which is why lighting retrofits are always the you know tip of the spear or lowest hanging fruit or 
whatever analogy you want to have there. So that's that for the you know quantitative aspect on the uh, LED lighting retrofits. And I don't know if there are any questions there before I start talking about the qualitative aspects that I've seen. You know, it's, it's um, you know, Stephen, it's kind of interesting. I was speaking with one of my friends the other day. They were in Publix. And obviously the tenant is going to notice. Well, I, let me backtrack a little bit. The landlord might be a little bit reluctant because they have to pay for the increased cost of the LED. And they're, you know, unless they're really in a competitive environment, they're sort of looking, they're like, well, why should I pay for that? And I'm not sure that's really a legitimate argument. We can get to that later. They pay the, they pay their own electric. So every month they're paying their own electric. And one of my friends was in, in Publix the other day and he goes, you know, every Publix is the same. It's like, I don't know what's wrong with their coolers. I'm like, what are you talking about? She said they just flicker on and off. And I'm like, what do you mean they flicker? They flicker on. I said, well, they flicker. They sit, but they seem to come on right when I pass by. I said, you, you, you realize they're motion <laughs> censored, right? <laughs> like that's one of the green. And they're like, no way. I'm like, watch when you go by. They flick on when you come within about two doors. They're like, oh, I never thought about that. That's probably what, exactly what's happening. <laughs> Hysterical. I mean, like people don't realize this type of thing's going on all, all over the place. But you talked about grocery. It sort of triggered this story that I had with a friend of mine about it, what Publix is doing. Yeah. Is doing. I, I mentioned that heat load of the lighting. A big reason they do that is if the lights are burning all the time, then their refrigeration system has to remove that heat that those lights are introducing into that freezer or cooler. So by turning off the light, then you don't have that, that heat. So I think that's a, a big reason they do that. But yeah, that's, that's a perfect example. Are, are you doing that type of thing with, with grocery stores too? Like, would you, if they're not, if they're just using like lights, just burning inside of the, of the refrigerator doors that you're going in and talking to them about replacing those? Yeah. And nowadays in the grocery industry, they, they've all kind of got on board and they all have their systems in place. And typically uh, both grocery and big box retail, uh, they have their vendors they use and they say, Hey, we just need you to, to do the audit and tell us what we need. We'll ship it to the site. We need you to install it. So we'll do a lot of that where we'll just go out and do the audits and tell them what they need. They have their vendor. So, you know, at this point on the LED side, it's, it's, it's very mature. And a lot of the retail spaces, you know, they've already upgraded their sites. We even helped one large grocer uh, replace generation one LED with new version of LED because it's just the efficiency has gotten that much better over time. Yeah, that's a great example. So, so if LED is is the low hanging fruit, what what would be next? Maybe HVAC. Yeah, HVAC upgrades, and, and there's kind of two flavors. There's entire system upgrades. So if you're replacing uh, your chiller plant, and those are obviously expensive, large capital upgrades, and you're you're going to work with your uh, electrical contractor, sorry, your HVAC contractor to do those. What we'll do oftentimes are just come in and do a, a simple engineering analysis, you know, understand how the system is operated, uh, look for simple upgrades, or a, a lot of times it's honestly just thermostat upgrades or, or thermostat set point changes. So, you know, at this point, everyone's familiar with the nests or the ecobees of the world that you see in the residential space. And those are just, you know, smart Wi-Fi enabled programmable thermostats, <laughs> but you still see a lot of just the old school, thermostats that uh, may or may not be programmable, or if they're programmable, uh, they're not very easy to operate. And at some point, someone just set it to run at 72 degrees, 24-7 all year round. So an example of, of where we would start on the HVAC side of things is just understand what the control system is, how it's being operated. And, and there's an incredible amount of savings that can be done very low cost just by looking at that and saying, hey, you know, yeah, this the system's cooling 24-7, uh, and everyone leaves the building at 6 p.m. at night, so we could set it back to temperature and uh, turn it back on again at 7 a.m. So there's a lot of things around the efficiency side that can be done on the HVAC system before you get into system upgrades. You know what I've, I saw the other day, Stephen, was it's the first time I've seen it in one of the non-institutional level leases in the area was a clause that allowed for upgrades to energy efficient facilities, whether it be LED or whatever. It was pretty open, pro open ended, but it's starting to filter through. And this kind of loops back to the comment about the investor class, the landlord class being very skeptical about the savings and also skeptical about who's paying for it because what they see is a cash outlay. And they're like, how am I going to pass that on? Uh, 
to the tenant. What really is happening here is that there's a cost saving in the CAM, which gets passed on to the tenant. But I'm the one who has to pay for the capital expenditure to put these items in. And why should I do that? Well, what you're starting to see now, even filtered through outside of the institutional uh, level on leases, is the ability of the landlord to be able to pass that capital expenditure on with the improvement into green green energy. And really what that landlord's doing is buying down their CAM. So they are able to pass that on, ca- the, the capital expense of the energy and uh, savings improvement, and then they benefit the landlord being they benefit because now their cam's lower, which makes them more competitive with their neighbors, particularly if they're beating them, they're beating them to the punch. So if they can knock off 25, 30, 40 cents a square foot on the cost of running their property. Now they're much more apt to attract that larger tenant who's very conscious about what their overall common area expense is. So it's you know it's interesting to really just to see this not just from institutional level but also in in the now the family office level uh, start to uh, become more uh, aware and sophisticated about how to uh, share in these costs. I don't know if you've seen that recently. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that in 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 leases, but um, so. You know, we spoke a little bit about the efficiency, uh, and which is, the, I guess, the first level. But how about the renewable sources? I mean, is that effective for investors in order to bring down their costs? I mean, solar is expensive to install, and how efficient is that? And 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 I guess wind. I I just think of the North Sea and lots of windmills, but I don't really see where it applies on a large scale to investors. Yeah, you know, so the wind again at, at the lower elevations that you you know typically might see on commercial buildings just doesn't make a lot of sense, and so that's why the wind turbines you see in the Midwest or along some of the coasts uh, or utility scale sized. Now, solar PV uh, has been in use for I don't know 15 years on retail properties. The challenging thing that that Eric has, has touched on is the you know triple net lease or the fact that the building owner may not be paying the utility bills. So if you install solar, you're typically doing it to lower the utility bills and figuring out how the tenant might participate monetarily in, in something like a solar installation is a little more difficult in this scenario. So typically people are putting on solar who are the ones they might own the building or have a long-term lease and pay the utility bills. So if you have a tenant, they have a 15-year lease uh, and the solar ROI is seven years, then they just need the building owners sign off to install solar to lower their utility bills. Uh, but one thing I'll highlight here on something like renewable versus efficiency and, and even EV is, is we spoke a little bit about the quantitative benefits of something like an LED lighting retrofit or an HVAC upgrade. But with something like LED lighting, there's a huge qualitative improvement, meaning uh, and I won't name names here, but there's a grocery chain that I'm familiar with. And I walk in and of course I'm a lighting guy. So the first thing I noticed here in 2022 is they have not upgraded their light. And it kind of drives me bonkers because I know the savings, you know, how good they are and how the industry has done it. But the other thing I notice is they have different color temperature bulbs in some of their fixtures. And so what that does is immediately it just – it provides like kind of a rundown look in my opinion. Uh, so if you've ever been in an office and uh, you have w- one fixture, it's kind of like warm yellow. One is like sky blue. Uh, and you see this a lot in, in you know, uh, hotels or motels, right, where the maintenance guy is just pulling something off the shelf. You're walking down the hallway and you just have, you know, different color light bulbs all down the hallway. To me, that looks very cheap. Your eye is immediately drawn to it. Yes, exactly. And this is, you know, this is why I like talking about lighting because there's so many benefits to doing that. And, and Stephen, I'll, I'll tie this back in here to, to solar in a second. But with lighting, there's a huge qualitative improvement to doing it because not only can you can you standardize on things like color temperature and all the lights look exactly the same, and a good lighting designer can actually, you know, determine how much light you want to put on the walls versus the work surface and can make it a much more inviting space just by doing it. So that's what I tell any kind of a real estate or property owner is, you know, the quantitative aspects of a lighting retrofit 
just justify the main reason for doing the project, which is really improving the space, making it a, a, a nicer space to work or a safer space to work. And that's a, a, another aspect. A lot of my history has been in the more of the industrial or manufacturing environment or commercial warehousing, uh, especially when LEDs first came on the market back in 2010, 2011, we were primarily doing retrofits and cold storage warehousing. So Eric, you, you brought the example about the Publix uh, freezer and, and the lights turning off when you walk by the, you know, the pizza aisle. It's the same thing, except we were in 400,000 square foot cold storage freezers that were minus 10 degrees. So I'm walking through there with my refrigerator, which is actually a brand of clothing made specifically people who work in cold storage warehouses and uh, doing lighting audits and trying not to get hit by forklifts as I'm walking up and down the aisles. And we were putting in LED lights that would that would go off when a forklift wasn't in the aisle. But we were also increasing light levels by a factor of five or ten. And so what we were doing a lot of these spaces, because uh, existing lighting technology performs so poorly in general or in cold environments, a lot of these workers were working in unsafe working conditions, meaning the light levels that they were working in were below OSHA standards. But what was happening is the people who were signing these contracts to do lighting retrofits, they just, you know, they sit in offices. They, they never had to go back in the warehouse and, you know, it's, it's minus 10 degrees. So why would you want to do that? So a lot of times they just didn't realize how unsafe these conditions are. Uh, an example of, of this and probably more in, in your world in the commercial space is uh, nighttime light levels in parking lots. So a lot of people who would sign contracts for lighting upgrades aren't driving by their property at, you know, 10 p.m. in the summer or, or 6 p.m. in the winter. So they don't realize how poor the lighting is and how unsafe it can be, both from a uh, crime aspect or just from a safety aspect, you know, people walking through the parking lot and not being visible. So a lot of what we do is not just improve it for employee or tenant comfort, but also for safety. Uh, so lighting has a, a huge qualitative improvement aspect that uh, I think is why it's so fun to speak to commercial real estate owners about is intuitively they don't really think about it because a lot of people just take lighting for granted, right? Because it's just there, it's above your head. Uh, unfortunately, I'm cursed that I have to look up immediately whenever I enter a space to see what kind of lights they have. But um, it, it's real, right? You know, in, in different, you know, in, in the lighting world, there's different sales tactics on do you try to quantify uh, that improvement, right? So can you say, hey, you're going to get higher rent prices by doing this lighting upgrade because people are going to be willing to pay more. And I've, I've never done that because it, it's, it's hard to quantify. But at the end of the day, I think it's a universal law that nicer places might be easier to rent than places that look horrible. Yeah, no question. We, we talked about the low-hanging areas. Why don't we talk about some of the tax incentives that that uh, investors might realize, or tenants that matter, for doing any of these types of projects. We don't have to, I mean, I know there's a lot of them, so let's just, you know, cover maybe one or two of the main ones. Yeah, so for lighting, uh, there's one, this is both lighting and HVAC upgrades. It's a 179D, Energy Efficient Commercial Building Deduction. It's been around for a long time. The Inflation Reduction Act actually just improved it a little bit. So, you know, you may or may not be aware, I think, uh, or everyone might be aware that the Inflation Reduction Act is a uh, a name that was applied to a bill to help it uh, gain, gain favor with people. But a lot of what the Inflation Reduction Act is, is a clean energy bill. And it really helps things like efficiency upgrades, EV charging upgrades, and solar and wind upgrades through tax credits and tax deductions. So the energy efficiency side is handled through a uh, tax deduction that is 179D. And so I would encourage any listeners, if, if you've done any upgrades or are planning to do any upgrades, uh, look that up. On the EV charging side, which we haven't spoken that much about, it's uh, Section 30C for alternative fuel refueling property. And that's a tax credit up to $100,000 per site based on uh, the capital outlay. And that's actually transferable in certain scenarios. So we're actually looking to own and operate EV charging equipment. And, and we actually are doing our first project for a quick service restaurant client 
This is out in Denver. And so we, they are giving us the land and we're telling them that we're going to bring you EV drivers who are going to come into your restaurant and order hamburgers and soft drinks and all that kind of good stuff. And in return, we get to have access to the parking spaces. And so we are going to own and operate the EV charging equipment on their property. But as part of that, since we are owning it, I'm looking at this Section 30C tax credit to see if we can take advantage of it. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. But if you've ever tried to read the language around specific tax credits that are brand new, it's uh, very, very hard to figure out exactly. And I think they're still working out the kinks uh, with the IRS on, on how exactly Chris, that'll work. Chris, but- Chris, Chris, if you dealt with the IRS brother, you speak with your buddy, Justin, about this. It's purposefully vague. And the reason why is because the, the uh, any IRS person or a CPA will tell you, substance over form. They'll purposely leave it vague just in case somebody finds a loophole around it that they can go back and say, what was the substance versus what you, were, what you actually did, what you really trying yeah. to do? And so this is the way it always is with all IRS. And it's why anytime we're talking about whether it be uh, you know, opportunity zones or 1031 or whatever tax opportunities that there are inside of investing, we always tell our investors, look, I mean, can you do it? I don't know. I mean, I think you can. But at the end of the day, yep. the IRS is going to turn back and say, what were you really trying to do? Were you trying to cheat us? Yeah, right. And if the objective was to cheat us, we're going to hammer you. So they leave it vague on purpose. So so I was just curious on these EV stations. I mean, I always drive past. I don't have a uh, an electric car, but it always seems that they, they're charging for free. I mean, who, ma- who makes money or who loses money on this No, they're deal? not free, brother. Great uh, segue, I think, for me on, on how to tie back EV charging to commercial real estate and what I've seen. So I think in the past, meaning before, I don't know, this year when you start seeing a lot more EVs on the road, uh, they, they were free because there just weren't that many people using them. And I've seen them at commercial office buildings with the, the thought being that uh, our tenants are asking for this. We're, we're doing it as an employee benefit. So we are going to put in an EV charger. Maybe we make it free or it's low cost because our employees are going to be happier. And now post COVID, I've heard companies talking about using that as a benefit to get people back into the office, right? Which is a little ironic because Elon Musk, uh, made a, a statement a couple months ago about, you know, all Tesla employees have to come back in, in person. So that's tying uh, EV charging to the largest EV manufacturing uh, in the country. So to date in the commercial space, companies have been putting in EV charging, uh, making it free or low cost, or there's even, uh, you know, Volta has a advertising model where their stations are free to use, but they're really an advertising company that has, you know, EV charging as a way to get their advertising station installed in prominent places in commercial shopping centers. And they're making their revenue not on EV charging, but on advertising revenue. What's funny is they're, you know, those units are, are kind of undersized, meaning they don't give a lot of power because they're giving the power away for free. And so it's not in their you know, interest to, to give away a lot of power. So there's a lot of different models, but I think you know, those free models, those advertising models, uh, are basically doing it as an employee or, or tenant benefit. In our systems where we're going to own and operate, we're putting in the fast chargers, which are the ones that'll you know give you a full charge in anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And in that case, we are charging for the consumption of the electricity and providing that as a benefit to the EV drivers. Yeah, more and more I'm seeing, particularly in the Northeast, I'm seeing they're charging. I mean, there's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a revenue, it's a revenue model. It is. And, and we, you know, I'm, I'm working on a, it's, it's actually a commercial property owner up in Long Island. He owns, uh, I think it's like 80 spaces in the parking lot and there's a, a medical device manufacturer, or I think it's a hospital that occupies the space. And in that scenario, the utility has a program where they actually pay for the infrastructure. Uh, at this point in time, I don't think Florida has a, a similar program. There are some programs where, and I believe it's Duke will actually own and operate a charger on other people's property. So it's kind of similar to what we're doing with this quick service restaurant uh, where Duke will come in and say, hey, we'll pay for everything. Just give us the land or, or, and I don't know if if they maybe offer any kind of a lease payment for the land, 
but they'll come in, they'll put in their charger, they'll own and operate it. And the, the property owner just gets to advertise the fact that they have an EV charger and keep any, you know, the, the tenants or the uh, business gets to keep any of the customers who come in and, you know, buy soft drinks or snacks or whatever while they're charging. So you see a lot of different business models. Same thing, just like with tax incentives, there's utilities are incentivizing a lot of these technologies. And so the first question I always ask uh, prospective clients and customers is who is your utility and can you give me a copy of your bill? Because I always trust but verify uh, because so much of the project economics depend on who the utility is and what kind of incentives might be available. So, so Chris, in commercial real estate, we tend to focus on one side of the ledger a lot, is which, how can, which is how can I increase revenue? And we often forget to look at the other side is how can I decrease expenses? And so if people want to contact you to learn a little bit how they can decrease their expenses and, and talk about clean energy, how can they reach you? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. I actually post a lot. Uh, these days it's on, on EV charging. Uh, so I kind of have a newsletter that I try to publish every week specifically as it pertains to EV charging. So if you look me up, it's Chris Kaiser. Um, also, uh, my browser name on LinkedIn is Chris Kaiser Sustainability. My email address is C Kaiser, K A I S E R, at Sona Energy, and that's S O N A Energy.com. And uh, one of those two places will uh, get them to me, and I'm always happy to talk. I'm, you know, I think one thing that that's I've been fortunate enough always to be, work with companies or for companies that we sell solutions. We don't sell specific technologies, so it's kind of a open discussion on how we can help. Uh, there's there's a lot of snake oil in technology, or especially in energy. To <laughs> someone posted on LinkedIn yesterday about a company they saw at a trade show that was selling a perpetual motion device, and they were trying <laughs> to claim that it, you know, that it that, no, this this one really works and it's different. And, uh, I, I think energy can be a confusing topic, so there's a lot of snake oil, but I try to simplify it and, and be upfront and I really try to help clients and customers and, and solve their problems. And, you know, I always start with, you know, what's what's the goal you're, you're trying to achieve or what's the problem you have? Uh, and let's really address that. And then, we'll, you know, we'll figure out how to make it work economically if we can. But a lot of times, you know, people will, will come and they say, hey, I just want to save energy. And then you dig into it and they're like, well, I actually want to, you know, charge higher rents by improving the look of the space and offering this, this and this. I'm like, great, well, we can do both, you know. Awesome. Chris, uh, definitely appreciate you spending some time with us this afternoon. Is there anything else uh, before we let Chris go, Stephen? No, thank you. Um, we ha I'm looking around now as we're talking to you at our ceilings and wondering uh, what, what we can do to get uh, even light and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, yeah, we got blues and yellows. And yeah, all it over makes the place. me think that we furnished early American depression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah happy to uh, happy to talk. All right. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thanks a lot for your time. And that was Chris Kaiser from Sona Energy. Stephen, you know, energy is one of those things that particularly that, that you don't have, right? At the end of the day, <laughs> he's got no energy. <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's it's it is one of those things that most property owners don't really think about until they start getting competitive in situations with their neighbors and they realize, well, how is their cam X minus Y? And yesterday it was X. And when they're sharpening the pencil, trying to get somebody in there, it's tough. If someone else is being very, very aggressive on lowering their cam costs and you're not, you're going to get left in the dust. So it's, it's it, you know, property owners need to start paying attention to this because there are technology evolutions that are occurring right now that will affect the marketplace. And you don't necessarily have to have a tax credit to have it make financial sense. I don't know what you got out of the conversation. Yeah. And it's true that, you know, many times um, tenants are always focusing on the, on the actual base rate but they forget to add in the cam. And if a landlord is proactive and then points out the difference in cam, it'll make a difference. Yeah. I mean, we just, we had a deal we're working on here recently, Stephen, that the cam's 20% higher than the neighbor. And it definitely cuts into the rent that the landlord can charge. Well, commercial real estate has not seen big evolutions over the past, you know, 50 years. So they're not necessarily, it's not necessarily an industry where you see people changing rapidly. You know, adopting change right quickly. They just, they don't.
but they're going to have to because there are some fairly significant changes that have come down the the uh, pipeline here over the last 10 years. And especially, as he said, that some of it's low-hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah, exa- absolutely. So, Stephen, Chris was a great guest. For other great guests, where can our listeners go? So the place to go is to our website, www.investfloridashow.com. Also, download the app on your smartphone and listen while you're mobile. Guys, as always, we appreciate the time that you invest with us each and every episode. And until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas. And of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.